Mr. Higginbotham has requested uh, to allow be allowed to participate in the meeting from a remote location. Uh, so Mr. Higginbotham, you have a statement to read as to that? Yes. Uh, in accordance with school board policy BDD, I am unable to attend the meeting due to a medical condition specifically relating to a tier one at risk and immunocompromised family member. Attendance at a public meeting with increased potential for pos possible exposure to the COVID-19 virus prevents my physical attendance. I ask that the board approve my participation through electronic communication from a remote location, specifically from my home address of 111 Ivy Arch, Yorktown, Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. Before we take the vote on that, um, I'd just like to state that the meeting agenda is available by logging on to board docs through our YCSD website at yorkcountyschools.org. Uh, we're streaming the live video of our special meeting through the division Facebook page and YCSD TV. And I'd like to read the York County School Division mission statement. The mission of the York County School Division is to engage all students in acquiring the skills and knowledge needed to make productive contributions in the world. So for our first action item, I need a motion and a second to approve Mr. Higginbotham's participation in this special meeting for today, July 23rd, 2020. Uh, to do it electronically from his remote location at 111 Ivy Arch in Yorktown, Virginia, due to a medical condition. Is there a motion? I move that uh, Brett may join us online and that uh, because of the COVID 19, because of section B, D, E, is that correct? I think. I think that was, that may have been that, but uh, okay. we made the motion. That's yep. perhaps perfect, uh, Mr. Schaefer. Is there a second to that motion? Second, second to the motion. Um, Mr. Dr. Shandor, would you call it vote? Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Mr. Schaefer, may, um, motion was made by Mr. Schaefer, seconded by Mr. Maya. Um, Mr. Maya? Yes. Mr. Richardson? Yes. Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Ms. Garalts? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. Uh, so we welcome Mr. Higginbotham to the meeting. And our second action item this evening is uh, re resolution 20-33. Uh, it's a resolution authorizing specific procurement. So Dr. Chandler, I'll let you share information on that. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Good evening, board members. I'm gonna turn this item over to Mr. Bowling, who is gonna share um, what he tells related to this. Thank you, Dr. Chandler. Um, Mr. Richardson, members of the board, we have a procurement resolution requiring your approval this evening. And there's six items on the resolution, uh, and we'll, I'll run through those real quickly. The first two have, uh, have to do with uh, new trailers at your elementary school. The new station those trailers at Mount Vernon, Coventry, and Grafton Bell. Um, we're also asking for your approval um, for six uh, school buses. This is part of our normal uh, school bus replacement schedule. Uh, we also have two uh, requisitions related to the Grafton complex. The first is HVAC replacement. This is not insurance related, this is uh, to the, related to the two year project. Uh, it's $90,000, so over $60,000. Um, is related to electrical panels that need to be brought up to code. Um, so uh, that's related to that, that particular requisition. This, the second one related to graphing complex is related to the fire, $170,000 and 102,000 that is uh, related to the fan motors and heat pumps that was recently discovered um, to be damaged. So uh, we're asking for that, your approval on that. And then last, if you recall, when we re re uh, revised the CIP schedule, there was one project that the uh, county and the school board felt that was important to continue, and that was the secret expansion and renovation project. This uh, $150,000 um, is the approval of that project. So those are the items on the resolution tonight. Is there a motion and a second to approve resolution 20-33, authorizing specific <coughs> I move that we approve resolution 20-33. Gerald, is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. Is there any other questions? Sorry. All right, Dr. Chandor. Thank you, Mr. So a motion was made by Ms. Geralt and seconded by Mr. Schaefer. Mr. Maya? Yes. Mr. Higginbotham? Yes. Mr. Richardson? Yes. Ms. Geralt? Yes. And Mr. Schaefer? Yes. Thank you. The motion passes five to zero. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to the uh, main topic of the meeting tonight, and that's our presentation for plans or options for possible reopening, um, or for reopening, actually not possible, but for reopening the schools. Um, so I'll let you share remarks before we begin with the presentation, Dr. Chandler. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. I'm going to let our team pull up our presentation. 
<laughs> All right. Thank you, Mr. Richardson, and good evening, board members. Before I begin, I want to thank our team for the dedication and work this year. It has been certainly quite a year for all of us. What we're about to share is the result of hundreds of hours of work conducting research, collaborating, planning, and problem solving. I do want to thank the school board. I know three of you just started in January. Uh, we're grateful for your involvement and your support. Not only have you helped us ensure that we have frank conversations with staff by asking thoughtful questions and plenty of questions, <laughs> but you have spent many, many days meeting with our team in two-on-two -two or one-on-one. -on -one. You've talked to team members, you've talked to our community members, you've responded to emails and, and phone calls, so we certainly appreciate uh, your support. Our entire plan is centered on these three collective commitments safety of our staff and our students, the instruction that we provide them, as well as our engagement and feedback we're getting from our community. So to share a few key strategies we use in the, in the development of this plan, first, our reopening work group launched in April. There were 20 members on that team that was led by Dr. Carroll, our Chief, Act, our Chief Operations Officer. There were several, several members participated, uh, additional people on this team, on these teams through eight different subcommittees. We had more than 80 staff members, parents, and community members, including medical professionals, and they all participated in focus group. I had a stakeholder roundtable, which included parents from each of our zones, as well as um, other community members. We met with our teacher advisory group, we, we, then we had focus groups with parents for three hours earlier this week, and then we had another section of staff members for another three hours. They gave us, they gave us wonderful feedback. Our principals have also uh, provided us wonderful input throughout this entire process, and our assistant principals. They've given us a lot of feedback. They conducted decision analysis. They um, conducted research as well. Finally, we also had more than 12,000 responses to the family in the team YCSD surveys. So as a reminder, the survey that was administrated, I'm sorry, administered in June, we asked stakeholders to identify their preferred learning model for the fall. At that time, 51% of our families and 38% of our staff selected daily classroom instruction. However, it's important to recognize that it's been approximately one month since our families and staff provided their opinion. The impact of COVID-19 has changed in our community. As such, we know, we know respondents' thoughts may be different today as compared to back in June. And my, I and I know board members and other staff members, we've received multiple emails from parents and staff stating just that. Stakeholders also identified their top safety priorities for a return to the classroom. Frequent cleaning was number one, more cleaning supplies for our classrooms and social distancing protocols were the top three areas that they identified. We also asked what improvement should be incorporated if a hybrid or remote learning model takes place. And the top three were number one, live meetings and lessons. Two, provide a format similar to traditional school. And then third, have instruction for students be engaging and challenging. Our team used guidance from multiple agencies to drive our work to date. As you can see on the screen, we, we reviewed a number of different documents, which include the Virginia Department of Education, uh, Triple R um, document that they shared. I believe that was 133 pages of, of guidance information. We've continually reviewed information from the CDC. We've obviously followed guidance from the governor's uh, phasing guidance. We continually consulted and reviewed information from the Virginia Department of Health. We reviewed research and documents from the American Academy of Pediatrics, as well as information related to the U.S. Department of Labor. Now, this is important because you're going to hear our team as we present this information refer to, to a number of those um, sources. Our focus group sessions also included representatives from the Peninsula Health District and medical professionals. So I do want to share a little, um, a little from our timeline. So I have two slides that will show you some information later. 
So if you remember, um, we closed school, and I believe it was March 12th or March 13th, to give our folks a chance to, to uh, prepare for not knowing what we were in for at that point. The governor closed all of our schools again on March 13th. The 21st, again, in April is when we formed our, our reopening group. On April 22nd, we developed, um, we adopted, excuse me, our student learning management plan. You're going to hear a lot about that tonight about Canvas. You'll hear a lot of information as well as we student demonstration. On the 18th of May, this board approved the 101 technology program. And we also, as we know, started surveying folks related to the technology window. I'm sorry, technology survey window. June 9th, the state released their Recover, Redesign, and Restart 2020 plan. And then uh, June 24th and 30th is the survey that I referenced earlier. Now we'll move forward to uh, July. Parent, staff, and community focus groups, we really want to focus on our engagement. And obviously this evening we're having a, a work session so you can hear a lot of the work that was completed. On the 27th and 28th, we have public comment sessions that are already scheduled. I'll share more detail related to that at the end of this presentation. Then next Thursday, this board will um, vote related to how we uh, begin the school year. And as you can imagine, uh, board members and, and staff members in our community listening, August is going to be an extremely busy month. We have a lot of preparation and planning to do. And you'll hear sort of uh, the why behind that during this presentation. And all that is to lead up to September 8th, which is our first day of school for our kids. So when you look at our presentation order, um, Katie Skinner, uh, our chief academic officer, is going to lead off the presentation. She has a number of slides that she's going to dive into related to our instructional models. Dr. Carroll, our chief uh, operations officer, will follow with operational matters. We'll be sharing uh, a lot of information, we'll also be sharing data that's related to from the Virginia Department of, of Health related to COVID cases, hospitalizations, deaths, and so Then Dr. Bladu, our Chief Human Resource Officer, is going to share some information on how all of this is going to be impacted by um, staffing in the Department of Labor. Finally, in the presentation, I will provide my recommendations to the school board. I'll provide more information about public the comment, public comment period, as well as um, talk about our family commitment process. So that's just a brief introduction to the presentation. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Skinner, and she's going to talk through the instruction. Ms. Skinner? Thank you. Good evening. As Dr. Chandor shared, this evening I will provide you um, with an overview of the instructional options that our school division is considering for, for this fall. Throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me refer to two terms that you see there on the screen. The first is synchronous instruction, and the second is asynchronous. I want to talk about these for just a minute so that you'll have a reference as I'm discussing them in the context of the models. Synchronous instruction is online instruction that happens in real time. An example of this would be if a uh, teacher is teaching in a classroom, there might be a group of students at home. The students would be joining in on that instruction with the teacher is happening at the same time. Asynchronous instruction, an example of that is it's a little more self-paced, first of all, and it's more flexible. A student is working online, but they're working kind of at their own pace. They're not joining the teacher in the classroom at the same time. I always think about synchronous, synchronized learning, synchronous instruction. Okay, so um, as we begin going through these models, I want to just share a few of the lessons learned that, that kind of helped frame our work around these models. The first one is our grafted complex fire. Um, we certainly learned a lot from that experience. Uh, one was how to make those alternating schedules work and all the work and all the cleaning that goes behind that. We also learned the importance of involving other school divisions early on in that planning process. Many of our students go to other school divisions or programs, and we want to, we've learned that we, it's very important that we incorporate them in our decision-making process. And then on a positive note, I think we can all say we learned and we're very excited to see how our community came together um, during that situation. The emergency continuity of learner plans, while it seems kind of long ago to me, uh, those were the plans that we used when the governor closed schools. We learned a lot from that experience as well. 
Um, if you remember at the time, the state was very clear with us that they really did not want us teaching new content and grading work. Um, the survey that we've done with our families and our community, we've learned that our, our families really want to see in whatever we're doing moving forward, they want to see improvements with our live meetings, with our teachers and classmates. Um, and we've spent a lot of time this summer doing that, and I'm going to share a little bit of that with, that, with you in a few minutes. We've also learned about, in, in the surveys, about 65% of our parents shared that they want an environment as close to school as possible, you know, a school day, and um, they want our students to be engaged in what they're doing. So this summer, um, our school division launched into something called Virtual Summer Academy. And um, when I mean virtual, every student who attended um, Summer Academy, including our um, ESY program, was virtual. We had 882 students <coughs> attend Summer Academy, and we had 65 teachers leaving Summer Academy. We also hired additional staff um, to help as far as administration. One of those staff members even has her doctorate in educational technology. We felt like it was really important to get some experts around the table. Uh, before Summer Academy began, we made sure that every teacher that was participating and administrator was trained in Canvas and in Mastery Connect, um, and so that because we didn't want our students to use that daily. Um, we also um, developed uh, walkthrough tools. You know, typically, in a in a normal school, our principals go through and they see things they observe. We developed these walkthrough tools for a virtual environment, and so our principal, our current principals, all of them, as well as our executive leadership team, did walkthroughs through the classrooms because we wanted to see what it looked like. Because it's not like you can walk down the hallway and see it, right? And so we wanted to see what it looks like. We wanted to see where we could help our teachers. And we wanted to talk to them about instruction. We also, um, during the summer, at the beginning of Summer Academy and at the end of the Summer Academy, we did parent surveys, teacher surveys, and student surveys. And we also did some um, forum groups with parents and teachers, a forum group of each, excuse me. We used that information to kind of frame and change and Decide, you know, what was going well, what do we need to change? We're trying to use that information as we plan for the fall. Um, one of the greatest things that I felt came out of Summer Academy was just to see the excitement of our teachers. They, they um, truly dealt, they, they dove in, put a lot of time and energy into making um, what I feel a very uh, good and successful Summer Academy. Um, our students in Summer Academy did participate in synchronous instruction and asynchronous instruction from kindergarten to 12th grade. And again, I go back to we have spent quite a bit of time trying to capture that teacher expertise. We're trying to almost like a sponge. Tell us, tell us what worked. Tell us what we need to get for our teachers. Um, you know, what about our youngest learners? How did that? You know, we, we asked all those questions, and we're continuing to get their feedback. So those are a few of our lessons learned. As we go into uh, the new school year, there are some things that we have to keep in mind. And our our team has. Um, been working around these, but I think it's important for all of us, our viewing public, to also know the expectations as we launch into the new school year. First of all, um, we are going to be teaching new content. All content will be new. The expectation is that we will be grading our um, students, and students have to show mastery of course content. We will also be taking daily attendance in the new school year as well. Um, the missed content from FY20, we have a plan for that. We've developed um, a, a process where we've gone in. We've already identified what were those missing standards. We've embedded those into the curriculum guides for the next school year, for this school year. And we are going to be using Mastery Connect, where we'll be using pre-assessments, teaching those standards, and making sure that we assess them on those standards that they missed. We're doing it very purposely so that we can make sure that every student, that content that they may not have gotten full instruction on, they have opportunity to learn that, and we have a record of that. Um, also, uh, one of the things as the as families had shared with us, but it's also important that we're hearing this from our Virginia Department of Education as well, is that we expect that the school day needs to be as normal as possible. No matter what model we move through, we want to make the school day as normal as possible to our students. Just last week, Dr. Or earlier this week, Dr. Sharon and I were on a call with the state about attendance. And you know, making sure that our students were taking that daily attendance, 
and that our students are um, you know, expecting to engage in a normal day as much as possible throughout, throughout the day. And last but not least, the state has, um, the state requirements for hours and days still remains in place. They have not changed those at the present time. So the models that I share with you right now are based on our requirements of 180 teaching days and 990 instructional hours. We believe that we're gonna be getting guidance from the state very soon about that. And so that will, that will help us model in each um, the days and what that day would look like for our youngest learners to our oldest learners, because we know we need to differentiate that. Okay. The next um, slide talks a little bit about um, the, the technology that we've done. So due to the nature of our current situation, I think we can all agree that our instructional delivery needs to be flexible, seamless, and of York County high quality. Uh, we know that our student, and students may, as our governor shared with us, we need to be prepared for many different scenarios. So we felt very um, positive that implementing that one-to-one -one technology program for our students will help them transition between home and school um, when, those, when those times are needed. Um, and also the Canvas Learning Management System, um, our students that use it this summer um, found it to be extremely helpful. It's consistency, and by purchasing that, having that on their devices, if they're in school, they can open it up, they have their Canvas day laid out for them. When they go home, they can open it up, they have their Canvas day laid out for them. So it's like being in school in some respects. It's almost like you're looking up the board, you kind of know what your expectations are. We, we will use that both in school and out of school as needed. Um, the other thing that we have purchased is our Mastery Connect assessment tool. That is going to allow us to um, provide students with assessments. It's gonna help us with those pre-assessments for missed skills. It will help our teachers really target um, what students know so the instruction that they're providing is very purposeful. Because it's on the device, students can go in and take a formative assessment at home, or they can take it at school because it's on that device. And then last but not least, I think we've all as a division gotten used to Office 365 and Teams. Um, I, we, I feel like we've kind of, uh, you know, we didn't use it a whole lot, but now our, we're using it quite a bit. And so the incorporation of that has also helped prepare us for the fall. So um, at this point in time, I'm going to turn it over. I think Dr. Cagle, are you on the line? Yes, I am. I'm going to ask Dr. Cagle, because I mentioned Canvas to you, I want Dr. Cagle just to kind of give you an overview of what Canvas is, because we are going to talk about it. I think it's important for you to see um, what this is and how uh, students interact with this. So, Dr. Cagle, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Mrs. Skinner. I appreciate the opportunity tonight to provide information about our new learning management system, Canvas, to all of you, as well as our community. There's been a lot of talk about Canvas this summer. Well, tonight, I'd like to share what, uh, what students may see when they access their Canvas accounts. I wish I could take everyone into an actual Canvas course. However, for student privacy re reasons, I'm, I'm just gonna share some snapshots. So as a student, um, when I walk into my virtual school, each of my courses are front and center on my dashboard. Now, these, this dashboard is for um, that you see here is for Summer Academy, so you only see two courses. In the fall, students will see more tiles as they will have more courses. Each of these tiles is a virtual classroom that students can move in and out of, just as they would walk to and from class in a brick and mortar building. And just like a typical st school day where students hear the daily announcements, here, as a student, I can see the announcements for upcoming clubs and student activities, as well as other information shared by the school. In addition, to keep me organized, I have my to-do list and recent feedback from my teachers. The dashboard also includes my calendar, inbox, and a link to Mastery Connect, our new learning management system. Furthermore, I have access to Canvas's 24-7 help support. So now, let's enter a classroom and students do this by simply clicking on one of the tiles. 
So here you see an example of Mrs. Hibbs' classroom homepage. Often when we think of virtual learning, we think of high school. However, elementary students and teachers found a lot of success with Canvas during the Summer Academy. So this example shows what a third grade student might see when he or she enters the online classroom. So as a student, I'm welcomed by my teacher and there are colorful buttons and a side menu on this homepage to take me to all the necessary places I need to go to in the classroom. In addition to the homepage, as a student, I also have access to a page about my teacher, which includes a welcome video, contact information, and office hours. So let's take a moment and look at what else I might see in Mrs. Hibbs' class. <clears throat> so now it's time for math class. The topic and the learning objectives are posted, as well as a link and time for a Teams meeting with my teacher and classmates. Now, this is an example of the synchronous instruction that Mrs. Skinner talked about. In addition, there's, there's asynchronous instruction for me. My teacher has information about what I must do today, as well as other activities I may do to continue to practice a review, or maybe just um, continue learning the topic. Mrs. Hibbs has included links and helpful hints to make it easy for me to navigate, which is really important to those elementary students, and help me find what I need. And she's also made this um, her virtual classroom engaging and fun. Now let's visit a module um, in Mrs. Madrigal's seventh grade math class. Modules are a very important component of an online classroom. So as a student, I access the modules link to see an organized sequential plan for my school day, or maybe it's for the week. For me, this is much more organized and streamlined than my three ring binder, which may not always be neat and orderly. I don't have to search through that binder to get started with my day. All I need to do is click a link. And when I do open the link, the activities and their instructions are right in front of me. Here on the left, you see a video that the teacher recorded showing how to solve linear applications. As a student, if I don't understand during the real-time instruction with my teacher, I can watch the recording as many times as needed. And if I'm a parent helping my student, I might need to watch that video as well. So in addition to adding recorded videos, my teacher can also add instructional videos from approved online resources. And that's one of the great things about Canvas is everything's right there together. And Canvas allows you to integrate a lot of websites and resources for a one-stop shop. On the right, my assignment is to participate in a focused discussion with my peers. That, that community and classroom um, environment feeling where you're building community is very important in those chats and discussions. These are just two of the many types of activities that I will participate as a in as a student during the day or week. So tonight, um, you're going to hear about how highly successful our virtual summer academy was, and you'll hear stories from some of our teachers. But for now, I wanted to share with you um, what some of the parent and student responses were that caught my eye when I was reviewing the um, survey results. I may not be able to share them all, but overall, I can say that this learning management system really made a difference for our students and families. I'm really excited about the potential this resource holds for instruction in the fall and beyond that. And thank you, Ms. Skinner, for the opportunity to share a brief overview of this Canvas learning management system. Thank you, Dr. Cagle. So that's just an overview. Um, of course, there's a lot more to this, um, and it's used in a variety of different ways. We thought it would be very important for you to kind of just see what it looks like for a student. Very much like getting off the bus, you're you know, you going to school. Here, you're opening your computer. You're going to class. And so um, now what we want to do, we thought would be very helpful, is to just share a few videos of our teachers who were in Summer Academy. Um, they have a few things to share about their experiences with using Canvas and their instructional practices this summer. I'm Katie Berwine. I am a fifth grade teacher at Bethel Manor Elementary and I've been in York County for 15 years. This summer with Summer Academy, I was able to get familiar with the Canvas platform with remote learning. I have taught Summer Academy for 12 years in the past, so I was quite nervous about what would be different with this experience. 
but there was hardly any differences. I was able to align my lessons to their standards based on the pre and the post test. I was able to form those connections with the students to really get them engaged and keep them coming. And the students were able to form relationships among each other. With the Canvas platform, I really minimized a lot of my lesson planning by having a collaborative community. So not only other teachers in York County, but there was a plethora of teachers on the Canvas community that had already created lessons and ideas that I could branch off from. So it's definitely um, a new way of thinking and a new way of teaching, but it's definitely very pleasant and I, I enjoyed it. I'm Kyle Boyd. I'm a math teacher at Grafton High School. I teach typically Algebra 1 and Trigonometry. And over the summer I've had the opportunity to use the Canvas platform to facilitate Grade 8 math. And one of the things I'm really loving is that it seems to be refreshing my teaching. I'm able to organize the modules, organize the materials, have it all centrally located, uh, collaborate with my other Grade 8 math teacher, have everything nice and organized and ready to go. Some of those ideas that I've wanted to try for a couple of years I've finally been able to put into place um, and we've been able to minimize the number of students who are asking I don't know what I was supposed to do it's all laid out in canvas very neatly and it's kept us more organized I'm Stacy Smithley I'm a fourth grade teacher at Magruder Elementary School I've been a teacher for five years now and I'm currently teaching the summer Academy as a summer Academy um, teacher I was very nervous about um, being in Canvas, the new platform, but I have found that it is a true reflection of what takes place in the classroom with whole group learning, guided practice, and having those small groups with the students. Um, I'm actually excited about having Canvas in the fall. My name is Emily Spady and I've been teaching at Grafton Middle School sixth grade math for the last five years and I had the opportunity to teach remotely for Summer Academy this summer. One of my biggest staples has always been organization and convenience for families and students to help ensure their success in the classroom. Canvas has made that so easy this summer by making everything available in one location. We can set up links for live meetings and small groups and um, also include all of their work, their grades, everything is all in one location. There's really no excuse that they can't find it, both students and their families. Um, some of the biggest feedback I've received from parents is that they love the structure um, and how user-friendly it is that they can go in, they can observe uh, how their student is doing and really see more than ever uh, that they've seen before. Um, one of the things that it's also probably important for you to know is that we did train every York County school teacher on Canvas before they left for summer. Um, we felt like it was really important that we give that training to them before they left. And we have um, many, many more, there's um, many modules out there. There's Facebook pages, our teachers are collaborating on Facebook um, that connects Canvas. And so there, there'll certainly be more training coming, but we did give them a good foundation prior to leaving for the summer on um, Canvas. So now that we've spent some time really looking and building some background knowledge, I want to now share the York County School Division Flexible Framework that will surround much of our conversation this evening. So this, this screen provides a visual of four different modules that the school division is considering for opening of school in September. As you can see, the first model is traditional. It's what, what most people are familiar with. At the opposite end of this is the um, remote learning model where instruction is offered completely online. As the governor has shared, schools must be flexible in their approach to learning this upcoming school year. As such, we've developed two additional models. The first one is hybrid, which is a blend of face-to-face -face instruction and online learning. And the level model it provides a hybrid experience for elementary students while secondary students learn through remote instruction. This slide provides, the, it kind of gives a graphic of the flexibility of this module or this framework, excuse me. As a division, um, we may need to move between models based on COVID-19 cases within our community and our surrounding communities, as well as within our individual schools. Other factors such as staffing, transportation, and student enrollment may also prompt us to have to move between these models. So now, I've, um, now what I'd like to do is, um, and well, as I go through these models, Dr. Carroll's also going to point out some of the health and wellness considerations as we kind of go through those. 
So I'm going to begin with the traditional model. A traditional model follows a five day, the five days of face to face instruction with teachers and fellow students. It's what we're most, com most comfortable we know. Um, it follows a normal bell schedule. It creates a sense of routine for our students. Um, but when we think about a traditional school or traditional model, we tend to think of how we've always known school to be. One of the models that we're proposing is a traditional model, but it's really important that we remember that a traditional model, even in a traditional model right now, school will look very different than it has. And so Dr. Carroll is now going to share some of those considerations for us. Right, so thank you, um, Mr. Skinner. So the traditional model is the one that gives us the most difficulty to protect children and staff from the COVID-19 virus. So one of the big things that we would be trying to do is so socially distance our students. And we would have to do that to the greatest extent possible, but we wouldn't be able to give any guarantees. Uh, so meeting the CDC guidelines in almost all cases would be very difficult, but we make every effort. Uh, masks and face coverings is also something that's very crucial to helping spread the disease. And those would likely be worn every day all the time in a traditional format. Okay. So, the next... I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I can't, I certainly will. I mean, I can <laughs> So the other, thing, the other thing about a traditional model, one of the limitations is really, is that it is it reduces any opportunities for large group gatherings. So eating in a lunchroom together, gathering in the commons at Tau High School, um, gathering outside in, less, you know, in smaller groups, the auditorium, field trips, all of those are limitations, things that our students would not be able to do. The other um, real limitation has to do with some of the classes that we offer. Um, the American Academy of Pediatrics has um, given some guidance to us about any of the classes that we offer that have a lot of auxiliary Exhalation. Exhalation, thank you. I always struggle on that word. Exhalation. Um, and those are classes like PE, band, music, chorus, any of those co courses. And really, they encourage even up to, was it 10 feet social ten, distance? Ten feet for that. Yes. Which would make it very difficult to have those classes within the building. Most of what they're recommending is really to think of outside for those courses. Um, so students could be separated. So those are just some of the considerations about traditional. We're going to move now into the remote model, which is at the opposite end of the spectrum, and then we're going to kind of go back into the hybrid level. As you can see um, in this model, students are attending school remotely Monday through Friday. There may be some exceptions where select students or specific classes do attend school in person in this model. But for the most part, a majority of our students would be attending school remotely. Wednesdays, as you can see in this diagram, have been set aside as a student support day. And during that time, our students would be learning. But our teachers would be holding things such as office hours, providing remediation, and also working on um, things such as professional development, um, having parent conferences, providing remediation, all those kind of things that need to happen. That Because we can't necessarily always have students in, um, they would be doing those things during that day. As you can imagine, there's going to be a lot of professional development that's going to need to happen, and there's going to need to be a lot of collaboration across our school division between teachers. This day provides the time for them to do that, but our students would still be learning online at that time. As I shared in this model, all, instru all instruction does play take place remotely, and it does include all subject areas and courses. It includes um, both teacher-directed and independent learning, both whole group and small group. So it's not just the teacher. There, we've done this in Summer Academy through small group instruction as well. It will include synchronous and asynchronous instruction through Teams and Canvas. So while the students might all be sitting in separate locations, there'll be times, and I'll share with you in just a minute, that they will be together as a class, they'll be together in small groups. And then um, students who have additional academic needs, as I shared before, may receive some face-to-face -face instruction during this model as well. That would be outlined in their individual learning plans or for a specific class that we might offer. So now what I'd like to do to kind of walk you through a daily schedule for elementary students in a remote model. 
think this is important so you can kind of see what this might look like if you've never experienced this type of learning. On the left side of the screen, you'll see a sample elementary schedule. I emphasize that this is a sample, so if anyone is watching this, this is not our set schedule. Again, as I shared, we've not gotten our final guidance as far as hours from our state department, but we wanted to just kind of say, this is what a normal elementary schedule might look like. Um, and um, another important consideration is, nowhere in any of these models do we expect our students to be sitting in front of a computer from eight in the morning till 3.30. And I think I need to make that very clear. So what, what happens in this schedule on the right, so if I was, um, let me backtrack, I wanna say one other thing. We, what we would expect during this remote instruction is where you see those, those clocks, that indicates synchronous instruction. So every day our classes would begin together in a synchronous morning meeting, because right now in our elementary schools, we start our schools days with morning meetings. That's where we do a lot of our social emotional learning and those things. We greet each other, we spend time talking. We would still have those things happening synchronously and we would close the day doing that as well because it's important that even though our students are gonna be, would be far away from each other, there's still a class and they still need to get to know each other. So I wanna break open just that literacy block piece real quick so you can kind of see what would that look like for our students. So on the right hand side, you would see in that literacy block, you would begin, if I was, if this were my schedule, and this would be in Canvas. So I'd be in Canvas, it would tell me exactly what I'm gonna do. I would start with a mini lesson, and that's gonna be synchronous. So I'm going to be um, clicking that button, I'm gonna be joining the class, and if Dr. Carol and I, we might both be in our own homes, we'd be joining that class together, we'd be doing that, and then he might, his Canvas activities might have him doing something else after that, where at 9.30, I'm gonna now do a small group board study lesson with my teacher. So the teacher's going to be teaching me a lesson. I might have a dry erase board. I'm answering the questions. There might be six of us that she's working with at that time. After that, I would then do an independent reading activity with a book in hand, not necessarily on the computer, but a book, reading, doing an activity. I'd have a brain break opportunity at that time. And then I would also then probably be watching maybe a pre-recorded video on a writer's workshop from my teacher that she had done maybe the Wednesday before. And I would have maybe a writing assignment that I would do. So that is just an example of how the synchronous and asynchronous instruction kind of plays within that day. Now, if you look at the next slide, this slide provides a secondary remote learning scheduled day. Similar to elementary, students engage in both synchronous and asynchronous instruction. So for example, on the left-hand side, you would see this is a normal day. Um, the, the 2A or the 2AB is simply there because middle and high school have different um, second blocks. I would follow in my remote location the same schedule for the day, but let's just say during 1A, this is what, I, in my Canvas course, this is what it's telling me I'm doing. The teacher's already got in there a warm-up activity, and I think if you saw Mr. Ms. Hibbs' classroom, she actually had those do-nows. Okay, so I would do my do-now, and then I would have a mini-lesson with the teacher, synchronous, I would click on that, I'd join the class for that. I'd have a small group breakout session, and then I would have some independent asynchronous activities, discussion board, and a short quiz that I would take on Mastery Connect. My teacher can use that information to help plan for the next day's instruction. This, um, the next thing I'd like to do is I'd like to just share a little bit, because I've talked about remote instruction. Um, I want to just go back to something I talked about a little bit earlier, just about the difference between spring and fall. I think it's really important for, um, for our viewing community to understand there's a lot that's happened over the last couple of months, and I want to just kind of look at how those continuity of learner plans compared to where we are now with remote instruction, and I'm basing that off of our work in Summer Academy. When we heard back in the, in the spring that um, the governor was shutting down schools, our families, of course, um, you know, it was, it was a shock to all of us, so at that time, we um, had to really develop emergency plans. And when we did those, they were done, um, we had to do those very quickly. And um, while well, I give a lot of kudos to our teachers who worked really hard on those, they did a great job. They were in some respects re reactive because we had to um, work so quickly. This fall, 
Our um, remote learning plans would be very prepared and developed by their own content teachers, and they would align to our standards to be specific to that course. Um, also in the spring, our um, continuity of learning plans were um, intended to be kind of a primary review for elementary and middle school students. In the fall, remote instruction will be new information, new content taught and assessed. Last year, um, we had to use multiple platforms to access um, assignments. We heard very loud and clearly from our community. It was very frustrating for them, and we understand that. This fall, as you can see with Canvas, our learning management system, that will be a landing platform for our students. Um, students will still have to go out of Canvas, so if the student is in, in Canvas, and the activity is a, a map, I Excel, I Excel is a web-based product, they would click on it, it would take them to IXL. Some of them were tra actually trying to get single sign on server um, done so a student can actually just go right in. Sometimes, in some cases, they're going to have to log in, but we've already figured out how to do that with our youngest students. One of our teachers came up with this idea to have a little portfolio with their passwords. We've worked through that with our little ones, but hopefully, that would be very continuous. So, Canvas is a hub where it all begins, the assignments, but they do have to go out to platforms to do it on that web website. Let's see, last year, um, all of our work was asynchronous, and our students did um, have to rely significantly on adults around them, especially our littlest learners, for that assistance. We have been very purposeful, and we plan to be very purposeful in trying to make sure that the work that we do for our students is very age appropriate when they're working in remote instruction. Um, the addition of having our video integration, that came later in the spring, if you remember, almost right before school closed, we released the videos so you could see each other and do those things. That's helped a lot. Microsoft EDU is making a lot of inroads in that as well. Um, and then last, Lastly, um, there, last year in the this spring, there was no grading, and we did not take attendance. This, this fall, there will be grading and attendance taken. So it will be a very different experience in remote learning. I just thought it was important to share that with you. So now I'd like to go into the hybrid, which I shared as a blend of traditional and remote learning. And this schedule here provides an example of what the hybrid schedule would look like. In a hybrid um, sample, elementary, this is elementary, our students would be divided into two cohorts based on last name. And we have, at this time, we have not decided on where that would be because that, a lot of that will have to do with student enrollment. Our students um, will have two days of face-to-face -face instruction and then three days of remote learning. So for example, if I'm in cohort one, if you look at the, the calendar there, I would attend school in person on Monday and Thursday and I would learn remotely on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. Like the, um, like the remote model, Wednesdays have been set aside as that student support day for the teacher to do the things I had mentioned before. <clears throat> students would still be online doing asynchronous instruction at that time. The next model is an example of a secondary hybrid schedule. This mirrors elementary in that, but there's an addition of our A and B days. So if I'm a student in cohort one in this particular model, I would have face-to-face -face learning on Monday, which would be an A day, and Thursday, which would be a B day. I would learn remotely on Tuesday, which would be an A day for me, and Friday, which would be a B day for me. On Wednesdays, I would still participate in remote learning, but I would be doing work for a mix of my A and B days. <clears throat> Similar to elementary, Wednesdays have been set aside for teachers as a um, uh, student support day. And, um, and one other thing about this model, um, students will be able to participate in SOA, New Horizons, Dove School, as long as those programs continue to operate in the same fashion. Um, and so, but we have set this up and, and worked with our communities to try to align days and things of that nature to have a minimal, you know, a minimal amount of impact on our students. Okay, some of the considerations for the hybrid model, um, of course, one thing is it does have a reduced class size because about 50% of your students would be in that class, which allows for some individualization. Students would be able to participate both synchronous, synchronously and asynchronously in this model. So um, I'm at home, 
I can also participate with my class that's at school. So I can call in and we can be a class together. <coughs> Our students, no matter if they're at home or face-to-face, or, or -face, they would have those devices in front of them for that consistency. They would still be using Canvas, Mastery Connect, whether they're in person with their teacher or they're at home the next day and remote. Um, something else that I would I think is important to note is that we will be very purposeful in that age-appropriate work during those days that students are uh, remote. And so I want to share with you um, this next calendar or this next day. This is um, a sample. And again, it's a sample. I know it looks a little overwhelming when you look at it, but I want to kind of walk through um, right now, we're in infancy stages of really developing these, um, but for a pre-K through third grade student who really are our youngest learners, I wanted you to see what kind of what a day, face-to-face -face day with a teacher would look like, and then what a remote day would look like. So first, as I shared before, our students would begin every day with a class meeting synchronously. So if I'm at home or I'm at school, I'm going to log in through Canvas, I'm going to join my class for that class meeting. The students that are face-to-face, -face, you see on the left-hand side there, they are really going to be focusing their time with their teacher on reading, writing, and math. We're going to maximize their time with their teacher because so much of the work that happens with those young learners is done really in small group instruction, very purposeful, um, very teacher-guided, and we want to make sure that we maximize their time when they are with their teacher. Um, on the right hand side, you see um, what the remote day would look like. Now, I don't want you to think that they would be sitting there for five and a half hours doing those things. But what I wanted you to see is we'll be using those tools with them, but they're, when they're doing math or reading, it would be practice with their long learn with their teacher. We would not be asking a parent to sit beside them and teach them new content. That's not the indication of what we, our intention here. They would also have their resource classes available to them on those days, and um, also some science and social studies instruction. Um, our gifted students, some people have asked, you know, what, how will this look for our gifted students? Our gifted students would still receive their services through a cushion um, at their school site in this particular model. Um, and also as a special note, but this, this model does include opportunities for some of our students who have the greatest instructional needs that on those remote days, they could in fact be face-to-face -face with their teacher or coming in to get additional assistance from a special education teacher, a reading specialist, things of that nature. Okay, um, let's see. And, I, and again, this is a very general, um, this will be fleshed out in much greater detail once we have more information from the state. The next one is a grades four through five, and I'm not going to walk through all of this, but what I want you to see is we're on a little bit on a continuum with this. So our students are getting a little bit more independent, and what we learned and from our summer academy teachers, they felt like our grades four and five teachers were a little more independent, so they could participate in more synchronous instruction, possibly on their remote day. Right. The next one is a daily schedule for our secondary students. Um, on the left, on their face-to-face -face day in person, they would do their normal schedule, their four blocks. Um, they would attend all of those with lunch being included, more than likely, in their classrooms. Um, on that remote day, um, on the right, my schedule might look like this. So if I go to my 1A class and I'm at home, I would open up Canvas and I would go through some synchronous activities and some asynchronous activities while my other half of my class is in-person learning. We would, we would, um, we are planning in this model to ensure that every secondary class would have a synchronous component to it. That's how we would take attendance for our students who are sitting remotely. And the Virginia Department of Education has given us some further guidance on that. So. It's important to note that with all of these options under the flexible framework, that there, uh, you know, there are uh, considerations that are uh, advantages and disadvantages to either one. So when you look at the hybrid model, it allows a better chance for social distancing. Those students that would be fully remote would be removed, and then you'd be taking the rest of the students that will often break them into two groups. 
So that certainly brings the capacity and better opportunity to actually reach the CDC standard for social distancing. And with that, then possibly the opportunity to take masks off more often in the learning environment. It would still be on during transitions and, and anytime anybody's moving, but uh, it does give you that opportunity at least some of the day to take your mask off. Also, an, another big uh, thing that we'd be doing across uh, models would be frequent hand washing. That will be prompted at the beginning and at the end of the day, a couple of times in between. Also, with the hybrid, it, not as much as the traditional model, but there is some opportunity for a social emotional benefit for their well being because you're going to see their classmates two days a week and then be able to strengthen those friendships as you use those in the classroom. So there is that advantage. And then also with any of the in person, options, it may just depend on what schools we're talking about or levels. We will likely be staggering our times a little farther than 45 minutes because we anticipate more car riders and actually will be encouraging. Okay. Okay, so now we're gonna move into the fourth and final uh, framework, which is the leveled model. And as you can see, the, um, you can see elementary and secondary looks different from the leveled models. Students at the elementary level will continue to learn in a hybrid model with alternating days of face-to-face -face and remote instruction. Secondary students would be completely remote in this model. This prioritizes um, in-person instruction for our youngest learners. Right. Do you want to share some considerations on that, Dr. Phil? Yes, I would. So uh, this option gives us the best of in-person options for providing social distancing. Now, elementary would be the same, the secondary being remote. This actually gives a better benefit to the community because we have less students in a uh, confined in a building. And because of that, the same, the same goes for elementary as far as their ability to get their masks off. Uh, elementary school times would need to be staggered because what we would do there is we would utilize our whole bus fleet across just the elementaries. So we might have an early and a late, maybe spread them out about an hour, uh, and that might help us with getting uh, uh, more students on buses in, in a safe manner. Okay. So as I shared earlier, the division will select one of these four models illustrated on the left side of the screen that you see here to begin the school year. These models are flexible and it is expected that the division and possibly specific schools will need to move between these models as conditions change throughout the school year. Parents will be given the choice to follow the division's flexible framework, which is option one on the left hand side. Or if parents do not want their student following this flexible framework, that's a time, time sure. they may select option two, which is the parent choice virtual academy option noted on the right. So I'm gonna, the next few slides will provide some clarifying information about that virtual academy. And then additional um, information regarding this option will be um, posted on our web page. Uh, for, for this virtual academy, we are asking that um, parents who choose this, that they will commit until the end of the first semester for their students to be in that virtual academy. That allows for us to make sure that schedules and things like that are, are set and, and put in place. Um, the other students would be participating online from home five days a week. They would be having synchronous and asynchronous instruction. They would be concurrently enrolled in their home school and virtual academy, so they would keep that connection to their home school. Um, and they may still uh, participate in extracurricular activities at their home school. <coughs> in virtual academy, they'll still be recess and brain breaks provided during the day in that, um, in that virtual learning environment. Um, it will be um, staffed with licensed teachers from York County School Division, Virtual Virginia, which is run by the um, Virginia Department of Education, and then virtual high school teachers. Virtual high school is a program that we offer here in our, our school division. Um, it is really important that I that um, I make sure that I share this, that there are some courses and programs that may not be available in Virtual Academy. We have a very robust secondary program of studies. 
And um, it, it may be possible that we cannot offer every course that our students are currently enrolled in. Um, we will be notifying parents if they choose this, if there are any course requests that need to be amended. But certainly we want to do everything we can to allow students to, as much possible, to keep those courses. Um, so you can imagine my staff and the work that's going to be involved in trying to do that. Um, and then there will be some uh, standardized testing that the Virginia Department of Education is going to be mandating this year, of course, because SOLs are still on the, you know, still planned. Um, but we will may require or have to bring those students in for some of those assessments during the year. Um, specialized instruction, remediation, and intervention services will be provided in virtual academy, because I know some of our families may have that question. English learners will receive their services from their um, LEP teacher online. IEP teams will determine the least restrictive environment and appropriate special education and related services for each student. So we'll allow that process to work through there. And then our gifted students who are in virtual academy would receive those support from those services as well. Um, and Dr. Shandor in a little while is going to share a little bit more about that selection process towards the end of tonight's presentation. So I know our families and students um, with special needs may have further questions and so um, about what we've shared this evening. Each family will be contacted <clears throat> by their school's teacher um, prior to the beginning of the school year because um, we will have to look at each IEP to discuss if there's any changes or amendments that have to be made and whatever option we begin with. Uh, so that's important and I want families to know that, 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 that we understand prior to the beginning of the school year there will be conversation with the teachers and our families. But for additional information, we are going to have FAQs posted on our <coughs> web page. We're doing an informational webinar for our families that will be available on Tuesday, um, and that will be on the division web page as well as the Facebook app or the Facebook page. And um, we are going to be providing a dedicated number for our parents to call with questions. That's going to be on there as well. And we um, did move the SEAC meeting to uh, Wednesday, July 29th at 5 p.m. Um, so, because we know that parents would also probably want to be a part of that. And communication about that is going to be coming out next week. Okay. Last but not least, I wanted to just talk very briefly about some social emotional supports because I think that in all of these models, we know what we've been reading, we, we understand that this has had um, an impact on our students and our families. So we have and will build in social emotional supports within each of these, these four models, um, as well as our virtual academy. So we um, have a social emotional learning, we call it SEL task force um, in place right now. It includes in school administrators, teacher leaders, school counselors, school social workers, and school psychologists. It's being led by our lead counselor, Dr. Butler and Dr. Gould. The goal of this group is to promote positive relationships and to create a comprehensive social emotional learning plan as we move into the school year. Some of the things that they're currently doing, um, they are developing a needs assessment slash screener because I can't, they're still working on those pieces that will help support our teachers and helping to identify students in need of additional support. And on the right, you'll see that, that triangle, that's actually a document they're working on that will help develop, it, it's a tiered system of support so they can give some strategies to use with students as they, if they identify students in need. Additionally, they're looking at using some of the CARES Act funding to provide youth mental health first aid training to our staff. Mindful, they want to develop a mindfulness cohort in every school, and they are developing some workshops to help support parents as well. So that's some of the work that they are doing. And um, at this time, I believe I have one more video to share with you. Um, from our teachers from Summer Academy um, and how they used Summer Academy and how they were able to personally connect with their students. So. Hi, I am Jenna Rowe and I am a first grade teacher at Bethel Manor Elementary School. I have been teaching in York County for 13 years and this summer I was given the opportunity to teach with remote learning through York County Summer Academy. 
One thing that I pride myself on um, typically in my classroom is student relationships. I absolutely love coming to school every day to see my students smile, to hear what they're doing at home, what they're doing with their families. And I really wondered what it was going to be like when I entered the remote setting. But I quickly found that there is absolutely not a difference. My kids come to school, or our virtual remote setting, and they are smiling, they're excited, they cannot wait to show me their wiggly teeth. Um, they can't wait to show me their new spacer bars in their mouths. They are sharing books. They want to log back on and read to me. They just cannot get enough of being together. And I absolutely love seeing their smiling faces and hearing all about everything that they do. So relationships are still possible in the remote setting. My name is Kim Stratton and during the typical year I teach at Seaford Elementary and this year I was given the opportunity to be a remote teacher in Summer Academy. I think heading into Summer Academy I had quite a few concerns um, and probably the top of the list for me was how will I be able to make those student connections. And uh, what I've learned almost five weeks later is that it is absolutely possible to make connections with students through remote learning. I've been pleasantly surprised. Uh, the kids are asking to stay on. They want to show me things that they've made. They want to talk to me about their baseball games. Um, I've had a lot of positive feedback and just uh, two weeks ago I had a student who said I'm not going to be able to log on tomorrow Ms. Stratton because I have to go to the doctor with my grandmother. And so we kind of came up with this idea and she, the grandmother emailed me and she said he's so sad about missing class tomorrow. Would it be okay if he took the students, um, the school's iPad to the doctor's office? And I was like, oh my gosh, of course. And so he had his little headphones in and he was still able to join class right from the doctor's office. So I've just been surprised by the participation with the parents, with the children. And we're talking about families that we did not know. These are kids from all over the division, um, which was different than when we had building closures and I was working with students that knew me. So I feel like overall we've been able to make great connections and I've just been really pleasantly surprised. My name is Alexia Perkins and I'm a first year teacher here in the district. I had the absolute pleasure of teaching Summer Academy this year and I have to say one of my fears going in was if I was going to be able to have the connectivity with the students and the remote platform. I have to say it absolutely came through. Connectivity is key and it's essential to building those meaningful relationships that we have in the classroom as well. Um, I think the buy-in starts with us as educators bringing our enthusiasm and our excite excitement and our expertise about our knowledge base and education. Also. I would like to say that our, my teacher declaration that I would like to give you guys as well is that I've seen it, I've tried it, and it really, really, really works. So I'm super excited about the fall and going into a remote learning platform. And I'm so excited that I have the opportunity to work in Summer Academy this year. So uh, before I take questions, I did want to just thank um, we had today was the last day of summer academy. It ended today, and um, they did a lot of neat wrap up stuff with the, with the students. But these teachers that let us do summer academy, I just give them all the kudos in the world. They were they worked so hard, and they were just. I talked to them numerous times. I was in their classrooms. They would talk to me in the afternoon. Let's let's discuss how did this go. What do you need? What kind of resources do we need? They have been leaders and um, a true testament of the quality of our, our teachers here in North County. Really resilient to make this work. So that is the end of my portion of the presentation. I believe we're gonna take a few minutes for questions. Absolutely. So do yeah. you have any questions for me? I <laughs> sure. I'm sure there's, there's a few. Um, I, I do want to share these really good drink water. I, I certainly want to praise Ms. Skinner and her team uh, for putting together all this information. And I know that that was a lot to absorb um, sitting here for you know 45 minutes to an hour, um, but to me that's just a tribute to the level of detail that the team put into this work. And, and I also want to commend um, our summer school teachers and our summer school administrators, um, Abby Martin, um, Tammy Kerjarek, Mindy Adams, Albert Green. There were a number. They yeah, did such Kristen a wonderful Wood. job. Kristen Wood. And Kristen Wood. I'm sorry. Uh, they did a wonderful job, and, and we. I think Mr. Maya brought it up in one of the meetings earlier and said, well, how are you guys going to, you know, 
how are you guys going to assess all this? So you know, tonight was a good example of seeing that that work, you know, the work that those teachers developed, led by those administrators, and um, you know, clearly there were some some good results of that. So you know, at this point, we'll take any questions. <laughs> um, okay, so on it was slide 36. I don't know, you don't have to go back there. What you're making it sound like is if we're hybrid and I'm in cohort one, that I would be calling into class and learning alongside cohort two who's in the building, right? No, so um, cohort one on okay. the face to face day would be with the teacher, okay, right? The other half of that class is at home, mm -hmm. right? And there will be times during that day that the students that are at home will go, will hit a button, and then they will join the teacher in the class and the students. Yeah, if that's your question was. That's my question. I was yes. trying to understand. So I was just wondering, on Monday, would cohort one be learning one thing, and then when cohort two came in on Tuesday, they'd be learning what cohort one learned on Monday, or would they all just be progressing day by day? together those are the questions that we are working through right now um, we my intention is as soon as we begin to really kind of zone in on this I feel like our teachers and our administrators need to really be talking together those teachers that that went through summer academy know how to, I've watched and they know how to make this work I want them to help lead us through this process so I can say yes we could be doing that but there may be the best way to do this that we haven't thought of yet. And so it really depends, I think, on how comfortable our students are with synchronous instruction. I can imagine that this will grow and change. You know, if we're in this model for a long period of time, we may be doing it very separate. And then I think as our students make it better, they may say, we're gonna do a whole group lesson today. You know, and attendance at Summer Academy for our students was very high. And so when you have high attendance, you can do those things, right? And so I would imagine that we may morph into something like that, where they're learning at home and at, at school synchronously. And then we can, the next time when that group's at school and this group's at home, they're learning together again. But that might take us a little time to get there. Okay. Um, and one thing you asked, you talked about in there was that, is it, can you understand me about this math mm -hmm. one? Um, that kids would do independent reading with books. Yes, and I just envision kids that don't have those materials at home, and so I would just say we've got to be thinking about how do we get materials into those kids' hands, because yeah, they may not have access to a library, so, they're certainly not having access to the teacher's personal library that's in the classroom, and so when we talk about that, that's one of my concerns, is that making sure there's equity. So in Summer Academy, one of the things that we did, our, our school administrators did in Summer Academy, is they hand-delivered um, and some of the students came in too. I think they did a little bit. They had um, bags, grab bags for the kids. They had dry erase boards in there. They had books in there. They had, um, I think they had markers in there. And it is, our, it, Dr. Wright is actually probably right now making this list for me of the things that we know in this type of model some of our youngest learners are going to need in their hands to help make this more appropriate. So our kids in, in class now use dry erase boards all the time, right? And so hold up your answer, they hold up their answers. Those are the things that they're still going to need. Everything's not a computer. Sometimes a computer is just to get into the classroom, right? Mm -hmm. And we also know that they're going to need books, and we're going to have to think of a, a way of doing that, and that is our intention. Those are in our works right now. We're planning for those things. There's a ton of books in our classroom libraries at school. We have some things that we have to think about how we access What's been a traditional school may not be a traditional school when it comes to those things in the classroom. And so they will need those materials at home as well. I have more, but you guys gotta take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I have a question about the, um, I know there's no guidelines on the instructional hours yet from the state. Um, what about accreditation? Dr. Chandra, do you want to answer? Sure. Um, so accreditation, as of right now, um, the Virginia Department of Education has not changed anything with accreditation. Uh, we are still scheduled to take SOL tests. So the first set that um, tests that go for some of our, our high school students has been moved back right now. They take those actually right in the first month of school. Um, they've moved those back a little bit, but they have not taken that off. I would imagine that there's probably going to be some consideration about mm -hmm. changing accreditation. Um, they are still expecting us to give our PALS assessments 
in the first month of school. They're still expecting us to give our Virginia Kindergarten Readiness um, Program assessments at the beginning of school. And I those are, those are important for our students because they help us measure growth. And so if, if accreditation does change, we still have to measure growth of our students. Those are things that we're working on right now. How will we do that? How will we measure growth of our students if they're not in school, if they're remotely? Because we want to ensure First of all, that there wasn't a um, um, sort of summer slide, slide COVID slide. Thank you. Yes, mm -hmm. the regression. We've got a plan in place to address regression. We've got a plan for that. We have a tiered system that we we are putting in place for that, and for those missed standards as well. Right. All of that coupled with we have to make sure our students make growth from when they come to us to when they leave, and that that growth measurement may be face to face. Some of that may be on a computer with a teacher on one side and a student on the other. It could be in a cafeteria where we're bringing students in with this, in very small groups to work with a reading specialist to do some of this. So it will have to be built in some respects right. as we decide on a model. Right. And part of this is you, you're going to hear the word flexible all night. I mean, right. not only do we have a flexible framework, we have, the team has had to be flexible as they play it. So over the past two or three months, the guidance documents changed. We were in different phases. Um, you know, we're, the state is working as fast as they can as well to support us. I did want to share um, the team and I participate in meetings with the state superintendent every Tuesday. So um, and he provides a lot of information. As Ms. Skinner mentioned earlier, he provided some examples on how to take attendance. So we'll be receiving that memorandum, I believe, this Friday or tomorrow. Um, also, um, we're still waiting on that guidance from the the state related to 990 and the 180. Um, but what I'll, what I'll share is we still have to keep pushing forward and making our plans regardless. And, and, and we'll have to make adjustments and be flexible as we go along. Well, you, you answer my question, so I have one additional, and it might be a Dr. Carroll question. And I may be jumping the gun here, but <laughs> since you brought up equity, um, how are we addressing families that may not have access to internet? how we're gonna get the devices or they can't afford the device, that sort of thing. Make sure we're equitable with those families. That's a great question. So you'll remember we did a technology survey at the end of May. And the purpose of that was more, not as much about devices, but exactly about access. And those surveys have been continued to be followed up here as we ended the school year. So they wrapped up near the end of June. Uh, we are now at the point in that work where we're going to turn to those and start working through those students that reported that they didn't have a full access. And we're taking a three-tiered approach. The first one will be, do you know that your personal phone, smartphone, the hot, you have, now have hot spot, hot, spot, hot spot ability there that's been opened up by the federal government. So have you, do you know how to turn that on? We're going to walk them through that and get them to try that. Secondly, Cox Cable Vision is offering a $10 a month uh, internet access. And so if the hotspot doesn't work for them, then we'll start counseling them towards that. And then, of course, if we uh, really have some hardship cases where that neither of those solutions work, then we have set aside money in the operating budget to uh, assist either with subsidizing uh, the cost situation or if we could resort to some hotspots through Verizon. And um, Mr. Bowen, also there is uh, there's some grant funding that we're applying for for that for that opportunity also. So we're going to work individually with our with our families to get there. And then once school starts, it'll be up to schools to let us know if we missed anybody, and so that we can act quickly to make sure we get that. And th that same concern came up through the focus groups that we had. We had several parents bring that up to our attention, as well as teachers who said, "Listen, I know you, yeah. you know, a few kids that do not have that access." And the response was. You know, I'm, A, I'm glad you know. B, contact the school, make sure one of your administrators or so they can pass that information on so we can provide. Some and it was primary among the minds of the one on one technology. One of the early issues we talked about and started acting on. That way, you know, we started our work mid to late April when we already had that, uh, we had that access survey out by the middle of May. Another unique feature of Canvas is a student <laughs> can download the content of their assignment. If they're in school, so if I'm in school to right. Monday, I can download anything and then I have it on my device whether I have connectivity or not. The only limit is if you're going to a web-based, that would be different. Right. But they can download those assignments to do those 
offline. And if we are not in school, we are in a remote situation like we were in the spring, you can always go, the Wi-Fi stretches outside the brick and mortar of the school, and you can just be in the parking lot and you can download those things. Mm -hmm. Some of the other uh, school divisions have talked about having mobile hotspots. Mm -hmm. Have we looked at that all? We, we have not because what we do know is the research will tell you that the very best option is for the student to be using it in their home. Mm -hmm. So while that would be a opportunity of, of last resort in my mind, there's also difficulties with that. And so those only go so far. They can only get parked at certain places. So we want to make every effort for that student to be in their home working so that they can be comfortable inside and doing their work. Mr. Higginbotham? Yeah, yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, the first one is about uh, the gifted services. You said, <clears throat> excuse me, you said that there will be gifted services if we are in the building, whether it's a traditional or hybrid or leveled sense. But um, if we're in an all remote um, situation, are those services still going to be available to those students who've been identified? Yes, they are. Um, we, uh, the gifted teachers, um, actually requested to meet with me a couple weeks ago. They had proposed a plan for um, a different way. They, you know, of course, at that time they did not know, but they they wanted to say, you know, we can make this happen. We can do this. They had their ideas. We've met. They're actually working on those plans right now. And yes, um, if if a parent chooses to go to the virtual academy option, yes, we can provide services to those students. Um, and uh, as the teachers are actually going to spend about, I think we like two weeks of time this summer. Um, they're doing some unique professional development, and they're reworking some of their units to help make that happen. So they're in the process of getting ready to ramp up for that. Okay, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it sounded like when you were talking about the virtual academy, um, the teachers for the students and families that decide to do the virtual for at least that first semester, those teachers are going to be different teachers than the ones who are teaching in a traditional or hybrid or leveled, correct? With the exception of the gifted services you just spoke of. I will tell you, um, our plan is, uh, we definitely want qualified teachers for our students. You know, the, the quality of instruction in the virtual academy must be your county quality. But um, where, which teachers we use, we're in a process right now, we put together some thoughts of allowing teachers to apply for this so that you could do this in addition to your normal um, course of instruction that you teach. We have teachers now in your county do that through virtual high school. Um, and so it may be that we can use those teachers. We may also, depending on the number of students who select this option, we may have some classes that get down to very few students in a class in the flexible model. And if that's the case, we may be able to get a sign a virtual class to that teacher and those other five students might their schedules might be moved to a different class, that makes sense. There's a lot of work that has to be done around that. It really is going to depend on the number of families who select this. And again, I always give that caveat that we may not be able to meet every class because our course loads are, are, are very unique, some of them, but we will do our best to do that. Did that answer your question, Mr. Hickman? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Is the goal to have all grade levels more aligned in their instruction? I'm just envisioning if you've got Canvas and you've got um, second grade teachers across the division that are working together to try to put together their um, their lessons, their videos, and all those mm -hmm. kinds of things. Is there is the goal then to have them more aligned across second grade? Yes, throughout the entire division. Yes. So one of the things that we did right when um, in April we developed in Microsoft Teams. You have Teams. We took and made a like a second grade team across the division. So every second grade teacher in our school division now has a common team. They can they can just click a button and have a collaborative session wherever they are in the United States or wherever. They click a button, they can all plan together. Just like we joined by teams, they can do that. They are collaborating, they're using that time, that that opportunity to do just that. But as far as guidelines for our students. We do want to provide some guidelines as far as very clear expectations about the amount of time and what that would look like grade level by grade level. We feel like that's really important. We want to make sure that if I'm a student 
a fourth grade student at Magruder Elementary School, and I'm a fourth grade student at Tab Elementary School. My, just like in any, my, what my teacher's teaching me or the activities I'm doing might vary, but there should be same expectations as far as the amount of synchronous instruction, the amount of time the work is taking for students to do, because this is gonna be very new. You saw you know, 65 teachers who did this, right? We have a lot more teachers who have never done this, that I'm sure are very nervous about this, this process or, or are doing this. So the best thing to do is to collaborate, is to work together in teams, and we're going to provide that time at the start when they come back to give them that time to begin collaborating. Canvas has some wonderful ways of doing that already built in. So I, I feel strongly that um, it may not be a mirror reflection if you're, but there will be um, a lot of similarities because of the, the expectations we set up. I think that's one of the things that I've heard most in my conversations from parents is they don't, because they haven't seen the new way of doing things, they're only going based on the fear that they felt at, during that right. spring. Sure. Yeah, and sure. when they're speaking with their friends, they're realizing that, oh my gosh, so-and-so is having um, synchronous conversations with their teacher, they're engaging, there's 28 kids that are logged in, mm -hmm. that teacher's um, emailing me, the team of teacher's emailing my kid, and then for another kid it was complete crickets. Right. And so that's why I'm saying is the alignment and the expectation that we're going to be reaching out and engaging kids all the same, so that again, a, a fourth grade student at Magruder would be having the exact same experience as a fourth grade student at York Elementary School. I absolutely agree, and we did have clear expectations for the spring. Um, there was some ways, you know, when you are doing packets and that type of work, it's a little bit more difficult to monitor and track that. Um, with Canvas and with Teams, we developed, as I shared, a walkthrough tool our administrators were using, so there was some consistency about what we expect, and they could go in and see those things. There will be really clear expectations. I think that helps everyone. Mm -hmm. It helps our teachers, it helps our administrators, it helps our parents and our students so that your experience is the same. But certainly, our administrators will be expected to go in and make sure that that instruction is happening, those expectations are being met. Are they going to then be able to share best practices across the division? Yes, we are actually developing. We have a list of best practices right now that um, that have already been shared with me. And Dr. Cagle, I don't know if she's still on the call, they're working on <coughs> some videos around that as well for our teachers. The great thing about Canvas is I have a Canvas account. Dr. Shandra has a Canvas account. Mm -hmm. And when we develop these little videos, what we do is we drop them in their Canvas account. So last night, someone dropped a video in mine, so I know when I what it was. When I log into my Canvas account, all my modules are in there. So I buy, if, if it's a best practice and I want every teacher in North County to see it, I can drop that into their Canvas account, and then they can watch it and see, the, see, see that information, mm -hmm. and the administrators can also do the same. So it allows for professional development as well as teaching, which I think is important. I think the other feedback that a lot of the board members heard um, in the spring, and again, we can only go based on the spring, um, is that there were too many outside resources. You know, so many mm -hmm. teachers were using mm -hmm. six different things. Right. It was overwhelming. It was too much. People were having to remember logins and all that stuff. And I know you heard that feedback as well, as well and you guys have been working on that. So can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. So Sam was going to hear that. We have been working on that. We, um, we know that when this happened, if you remember, you know, we weren't a one-to-one -one school division. Our teachers used technology. They had technology in their classroom, but it wasn't their primary way of instructing students. So when you go to a virtual environment, you've got to start finding resources to teach that, that core, right? The, the, the chunk, as I call it, of the lesson. And so our teachers would go to this site and try to find that information and then refer the students out to that. And it was all based in Aspen, right? Which is not a learning management system. That's a student information system. And so they were doing the best they could with that. What's happened is, as you remember in one of the recent board meetings, you purchased Nearpod. Nearpod is a great web-based tool that provides really good content for students. And it's, it's, it's um, very popular with a lot of our teachers. And we're working to buy a few of those things that have consistency across the school division. And we're trying to make better use of the ones that we already purchased for our teachers to use and really limiting them to those things um, or things that are purposeful for our students. So in Summer Academy, I would say that, is it a perfect fit? I'm gonna be honest with you, I think the parent comments I've been reading, um, it's not a perfect fit, we're getting better at it. 
and we're going to continue to get better at it. Well, you know, my, my daughter was uh, a participant in Summer Academy and uh, was very, very successful. And in discussions with her, in, I, I, the compare and contrast that you had with regard to emergency remote learning or continuity of learning plans versus a virtual learning model, I think too that what we should impress upon parents and from our own personal experiences, I think you will find the learning, it's a learning management system just not for virtual education. It's the learning, it is the tool, it is the dashboard you will go to in a traditional setting. And everything, it's, as you know, a suite of tools to include calendar and video drops and all of those things. So it will become, frankly, their educational dashboard, regardless of the model we're in, which is a beautiful thing because that will assist teachers in moving back and forth, and it will likely be their primary collaborative tool. Um, that would be great. Yeah, so um, I apologize for everything. We've lost our live feed. So that's why Ms. Bob came into the room. So um, Mr. Graves, we're gonna go ahead and take a, a, a five minute break and we'll let the board members, um, all of us will take a five minute break until we can get back on, on live and then we'll come back to you. Wait okay? a minute, I, I have to start back where I was. All right, we had a short recess. I apologize for that. We had some technical difficulties with our live stream through Facebook. Um, Dr. Shander, I believe we're able to view this on YouTube, but our video has been recorded the whole time, so we won't have a, a break in it when we repost the video of the meeting. That, that's correct. Also, staff is going to post a message in the link onto Facebook to direct our Facebook viewing audience to YouTube. So, if you want, I think Mr. Myatt um, was in the middle of. We don't know. We got okay. a question that. Can start there? Sure. Sure. What, what, I think it was your question. Yeah, yeah you made um, a comment about Yeah, I made, yeah, I made, I made a comment about Canvas. made a comment about uh, Summer Academy. My, my daughter was a participant in Summer Academy. Um, very, very successful. But what I wanted to impress upon parents is as I was sitting through and walking through Canvas with my daughter, it was evident to me that Canvas as a learning management system won't be confined just to virtual learning, but I suspect as a dashboard with a suite of tools will turn into uh, a primary enabler for all of our students on devices and frankly, much of the coordination, much of the work, uh, handing in obviously assessments through Connect, but uh, will be done um, through the learning management system, whether we're in a traditional setting, hybrid or virtual. Correct. And I think that's important to, to recognize um, that dashboard and the ability for her to organize regardless of the model that, that she will be in is, is going to be, and prove to be very, very helpful. Very we, helpful. we had a number of um, Summer Academy teachers share um, with students that, um, that were in their class that had our students with disabilities some students who really have some organizational challenges and um, how helpful Canvas has been for those students. Um, uh, Dr. Cagle mentioned it briefly, but the fact that when you have that binder, I had you know, a child who had the binder that you, it was just literally falling apart, right? Papers going everywhere. Having it all kind of lockstep in one, it, you, you don't lose those things. For a student who needs to see things repeated, they can record and repeat and watch it over and over again if they need to. There's a lot of built-in tools that will be very helpful for our students who may need organization, who may need repeated um, experience, opportunities. I could just go on and on the list. It's going to take us time to learn it all, sure. but I'm excited about it. I'm excited about the opportunity for our, our, our students. One teacher at Grafton High School told me the other day, she said, I'm never going to go to the copy machine again. I don't think so. But so, well, it was kind of interesting. Mr. Hickenbotham, um, before we move on to the next uh, topic and end the question, I want to make sure you didn't have any additional questions. Because you're doing it remotely, we want to make sure that you have an opportunity. Uh, no, I asked my two questions before, and I believe they'll be available on the full video when it's posted afterwards. 
All right. Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. Any additional questions that we can move in? I could I touch one? Yes. Just one more time. Right ahead. Because I remember when my kids were little and they would be bringing home the little readers. I mean, every single day because I had to read them with them. <laughs> How can that work to where we can have frequency like that? Right. So we, we, um, we use a ben the benchmark series. That's one of our top reading series. When we purchased that a number of years ago, we have a lot of small guided readers. We also have access to the online readers. We've not really used the online readers as much because our kids typically don't have a one-to-one -one device. Mm -hmm. We've re-looked at that relationship and gotten those uploaded and they use those in summer Kathy. So there is the virtual piece. But to me, there's nothing like a book in hand, especially for our littlest ones. And we are going to be working with our schools to figure out how can we do this and work with Dr. Carroll about the safety piece that goes along with those shared materials. Because we do need to have students with books in hand. We need to make sure, we probably need to partner with our library a little bit on that as well. Um, so we, those things are coming. Those are the things that we still have to really flesh out. Okay. That's a good, that's a good yes. Yeah. Thank you. All right, our next um, part of the presentation, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carroll, our Chief Operations Officer, and he's going to share um, a number of slides related to operations, health and safety, et cetera. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. And for all of my presentation, we're talking about preparations for any in-person model. And we are preparing at the rate for the traditional one because we can, we can be flexibly adapt to anything that's less intensive, but that would be the most intensive uh, attendance model. So the first thing is when we talk about health screening. Now, the, there's a lot of thinking where you see examples going to a doctor's office and they take your temperature. That would be impractical in a school for getting students into the building, and, and those can be uh, inconsistent. So what we would be doing is encouraging both our staff and students to take their temperature in the morning before they come to school ask that they not come to school if they have a temperature of over 100.0. And, um, and then also we encourage them to stay home if they feel sick. Uh, as far as health scans, we'll be having our teachers every hour on the hour doing a scan of their room. Now, a lot of our elementary teachers especially do this informally because they're used to little ones getting sick in the middle of the day or in the late morning. And so we're just going to formalize that process. And we may even prompt everybody with a single ping of a bell or something. And so they're just going to look at the students that are in front of them on an hourly basis. You know, does Mark look okay? Does Jimmy look okay? And on and on. And then if somebody appears unwell, then they'd be sent down to the nurse's office. So let's talk about the clinics. So the first thing that nurses need to do is be responsive to those teacher referrals based on those health scans. We're also going to set up quick quarantine rooms. And that was something that we had already prepared for the last uh, pandemic uh, alarm with the H1N1. So we already had that in writing and uh, we'll be setting those up. But another thing we need to do to be ready when we have in-school uh, students is to set up backup for well care assistance, students who take a regular medication, that type of thing. So that we're trying to keep anybody who's sick away from those that are well and just need some medical uh, attention. So another thing that's important, you know, is face coverings. We're all wearing them here tonight. And students and staff would be required to wear them where they couldn't achieve a six foot distance. And we have a variety of face coverings supplied to our staff. We'll be ordering, I actually don't have it in the slide, but we're gonna be offering cloth masks clear masks and face shields. And a clear mask is one that's like a mask that you can actually see. And we're gonna do that uh, so that uh, teachers have the choice of those options based on the teaching they're doing at that time and what works for them. But they're gonna have to wear something uh, in order to supply instruction, especially if they're within six feet of a child. And we're also gonna have disposable options available for, for everybody if needed. You know, there are gonna be times where uh, especially the kids are going to forget their mask or something's going to get soiled, they spilled a milk on it or something. And so we'll have disposable options. We've already ordered a, a great number of those and we'll keep that uh, inventory topped off 
as we go uh, down the road. And you know, another good strategy, as you know, a lot of these are sounding very familiar to you is hand hygiene. Uh, we're gonna be encouraging and prompting students at least four times a day uh, to be washing their hands. We have additional supplies for that fact and we're topped off. We're gonna be putting dispensers uh, both in uh, remote locations outside on kiosks for hand sanitizer. We're also going to be putting a dispenser for hand, sanita hand sanitizer in every room. So there's going to be ample opportunity, and we have um, we already have those uh, supplies secured, and the the dispensers in the classrooms are actually being put in the first week of August. So we're already uh, rolling on those. It's important to note that it doesn't matter what in uh, in-person model that we would use that we are still going to have disruptions as long as the virus is alive in our community so you need to be aware of that that whether we were in traditional or hybrid or level we would be having those short-term disruptions school would likely in the case of any positive case either staff or students we would have to close for a range of two to five days most likely First two days are for letting the building rest for a day and then for a thorough cleaning disinfection uh, by our custodial staff. The rest of the time, it would be the uh, contact tracing investigation. And that could take just depending on the situation, one, two or three additional days over that cleaning time. So it would be at the end of that, uh, of that close, uh, I'm sorry, the contact tracing investigation, it may just only be four days, and then we would, we would return back to school. And anybody that had been in close contact with the known positive case would be notified uh, because of uh, uh, privacy rules. They wouldn't know who, but they would be notified that they had been in close contact, and they would be required to take a 14-day quarantine. Uh, and close contact is defined as being within six feet for 15 minutes or more. So as you can say, there's a lot of implications for this. Uh, first, you've got schools closing uh, on occasion, and it may be a very erratic through the division. Secondly, that students would have to be going from whatever that hybrid or level or traditional format now would be home sick, or uh, even if they're asymptomatic, they'd have to be treated as a sick child, and we'd have to follow up with them. And then also, we would have the reverse, is that we might have a quarantined uh, teacher that have to be teaching their in-class remotely. And so we have a lot of implications, a lot of ways that might manifest itself. When we get to our physical spaces, we talked about social distancing, that that's important, and that would require us reconfiguring our rooms, our classrooms and workspaces. And I'm gonna be showing you a picture and just a little bit of what that would look like. And in our communal spaces, our big, uh, bigger rooms, our cafeterias, auditoriums, gymnasiums, those types of rooms, uh, we would have to uh, re reduce those that uh, the number of people that are in those rooms. Uh, we're adjusting the uh, capacities of those rooms, and we'd be staggering the use of restrooms. And maybe every other stall is um, is uh, eliminated from use for urinals, and just controlling the amount of students who go into the bathroom at one time. And we would have to restrict the stationary equipment use in our playgrounds uh, so that we made sure that we had time enough to uh, disinfect in between classes because when they came off the playground then the students would immediately go to wash their hands. So to give you an, an, an idea of what the classroom looks like, uh, the classroom on the left has, you can see 20 uh, students in the middle of the room and then there's some, some desks on the periphery. You'll see rooms like this elementary anywhere from 20 to 25. This one has 20. And on the right, you see with a six foot distancing, which takes the capacity in this room down to 11. Here we have older buildings, uh, some smaller classrooms, and you may say, see other places in the region. And so we're really limited there to be able to ensure that six foot distancing, even at times with the hybrid or leveled uh, model. So another thing is shared equipment. Uh, Mr. Schaefer brought up, uh, you know, the idea of the, the leveled readers and those those types of things. And so we can have those, but they're just going to have to be rotated and taken off 
if, if a student uses them, then they have to go into a bin and be dormant for over a day. And just uh, some people are treating their mail that way because we've gotten uh, that kind of guidance. So that will that will be occurring. Water fountains won't be used. Won't be used. We do have water bottle filling stations across the division, not in every school, but very close. And we are currently assessing where we can change out some water fountains for water bottle filling stations. Um, and then disinfection uh, between uses for a lot of our student manipulatives. Now that's gonna be difficult in some cases because the uh, quaternary five disinfectant that we use might be damaging those materials. So if it's something like, you know, not Legos, but you know, plastic piece that's easily disinfected, that wouldn't be a problem. But something made of cloth or another material where we could damage it would need to be out of service for a while. Another thing that we know from our surveys is that cleaning protocols were of um, much interest. And so, first of all, we'd be doing ongoing rotational cleaning of all of our high touch surfaces, including our restrooms. Uh, you may know that we purchased over uh, 50 commercial sprayers to do this. And so those our custodians would be moving around the buildings on a rotational basis, hitting doorknobs, doing the bathrooms. We did a dry run in a bus and we were able to spray the whole bus down in five minutes or three minutes. So certainly to do a bathroom, hit a toilet, hit the doorknobs uh, or pull handles, the uh, sinks uh, would be uh, an easy two minute easy, and then moving on to the next thing. So we envision custodians will be moving around the building the whole day, just hitting all those high touch services. Um, additional supplies will need to be in the classrooms. So uh, especially in secondary, where you do a lot of room changing, then in between classes, we have teachers with spray bottles and microfiber towels, be able to wipe down uh, desks in between before there's a change in class. And all the protocols would be shared with all the staff so we'd be able to speed on what, what is effective cleaning and what we need to use. And on a day-to-day -day, uh, processes, schedules, we're likely having to be staggering our school start times. Arrival and dismissal times will probably be adjusted uh, as we uh, want to have more time to allow for students to enter and leave the building so we don't have bottlenecks at certain doorways. We'd probably be opening up more doors so that uh, less students are hitting particular uh, entrances to the school. And we'd be adjusting the hallway use. We've already uh, experimented with some paint and stencils that'll work, uh, make a really good uh, permanent fixture for now. And we can wax right over it with a couple coats and that, that'll stay with us as opposed to uh, you've probably seen a lot of the vinyl stickers that are being advertised. Well, those don't last that long and they're actually fairly expensive. So we found a cheap and effective way to do this. And we'll be minimizing or eliminating locker usage. Actually, a byproduct of the Grafton fires, the middle schools are really looking at stopping uh, locker use because uh, they, they couldn't and then they found it worked pretty good. And with the one-to-one, -one, we're going to want to have our students, uh, when they're in school, be able to carry their uh, device around. Another important factor what we'll be doing is limiting visitors and volunteers. For visitors, you'll need to have an appointment and parent meetings will be held virtually if we can't be socially distant or uh, participants don't wanna wear a mask. Masks will be, uh, will be uh, required of anybody coming into the building. We'll use the vestibules for midday pickups and drop-offs, so we minimize the people going into the front office. And uh, we will have no volunteers in the building as a starting point. There may be a point where we need some volunteers to help, uh, especially when I talk about the staggered arrival and dismissal times. We may find that we need additional uh, persons that would be willing to volunteer and help us out, but we're going to, we're not going to start under that we're gonna see if there's really a need. And our food services are going to continue. First of all, the division and our great uh, partner Sodexo is committed to continuing uh, the service for our free and reduced lunches uh, families uh, as we move on into the fall. 
Now, when we started in the spring, uh, we we had a lot of license, and we had uh, and we served a lot of families. In fact, this week we're going to hit our two hundred fifty thousand meal that's going to be served, and and the regulations continue to uh, relax as we went through the spring and into the summer. When we get to the fall, USDA regulations are going to kick back in, and that means we're going to have to require identification for these people that are having uh, that are eligible for this service. And so we'll work with those families on that. And you'll see that uh, the meals will be limited to the scheduled calendar school days. We were, we had gotten to a point where we were feeding for seven days. They're going to pull that back to the, uh, the days of the week. So if you have a Monday federal holiday, you're all only going to receive four meals. So that's the way it's always been. And we'll be going back to pre-existing. Now, the differences will be in how, uh, depending on the model, how we distribute. So if we're in a remote model, we'll be doing what we're doing now, uh, probably two times a week, but you're going to have to pro uh, provide your ID. In a hybrid model, the students would be taking food home with them at the end of the day for those days uh, that they're not in the building. And then the, uh, and then with the leveled model, it's a combination of the two based on elementary and secondary. So let's move to transportation because this will be a big one as far as safety and, um, and change. So first of all, we're going to be strongly encouraging our families to, to uh, self-transport. We can't, we do not have the capacity to, to run a full six foot social distance in the bus. It would render our, this uh, useless as a school transit strategy. So we'll be strongly encouraging everybody to car, uh, to self-transport and to, and to carpool with the same cohort of families. So maybe the driver rotates, but the same kids are being uh, transported so that we can limit that kind of cross-contamination. And in so doing, hopefully we can reduce our ridership. And so uh, we will be shooting for one student in a seat as they get onto the bus. Uh, they'll be marked in the seats where they're supposed to sit. And they're going to, they're going to load from the back to the front to limit people passing each other. But if we're not able to, because of not enough people self-transporting, we will start to put a second a student in a seat, same, same way, working their way from the back, um, for the back end of that trip. And we will do everything we can to separate the students and to get the ridership lower with uh, scheduling. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna start a tracked ridership program. We've never done that before, but in the family commitment survey that Dr. Shane was going to talk about, you're actually going to opt into bus and you're actually have to register to be on a, a specific bus. And that way we can track it. We can track what the ridership is going to be. This is something we're actually was already going to move towards to try to help with some of our efficiency problems. And now this gives, gives us the opportunity to get a real reason to want to do that. As far as cleaning protocols, uh, we're going to be using a microvan product that we're going to spray the buses down that has an effectiveness of 90 to 100 days. We're going to be reapplying every 90 days, and, um, and that should take care of that. On top of the, the driver or, or drivers and aides will be wiping down the handlebar as they come up the stairs uh, on our, uh, after every run, and the students will be uh, asked to uh, wash their hands, depending on where they're coming on the bus or after the bus mode, if that applies. And so we'll be, that's how we'll be cleaning the buses and keeping them safe. And then our, we will have to work on drop-off and pickup processes, working with the schools in order to allow for those, um, you know, the staggered start times that I talked about as far as entering the building in a reasonable fashion so that we're not having bottlenecks and putting kids uh, in clo that close of proximity to each other. So the next slide shows you what we envision with a bus of how it would start. You know, we, we would love to keep every bus to this configuration or lower. And so that's with ensuring the social distancing or as close to six feet as possible, 
only transporting about 25 kids. So that would be our goal to have a bus like that. And the next slide shows you uh, the worst case scenario, and that would be two to a seat. So they would start out in the one to a seat and then slide into two. In this picture, we've left the, the bench behind the driver uh, empty for, uh, for social distancing for, for them because it's really going to be crucial to keep them healthy uh, so that we keep having those bus drivers because we have lost some and, uh, and through resignation and retirement, and we're not finding a labor market that's uh, replacing them. Also, you know that a number of our drivers have uh, children or children in their care uh, that ride with them, and so we'll reserve that. Uh, that seat they could still occupy because they'd be from their own family. And just a few things about student experiences. Uh, we will, uh, when we are in session, have before and after school care from Champions, and they're, you know, they've been a good partner for us and they continue. Uh, athletics is a little bit up in the air right now. We have been cleared for summer conditioning, but uh, we're still awaiting what their final decisions about uh, the season are going to be. And then uh, with extracurricular activities, uh, those should be restarted. In the spring, we went to an emergency shutdown and we didn't do any of those, but we think they could be done virtually or either done in a small uh, a format at schools. And so we look forward to that kind of engagement from our students going back. Before I hit my last slide, there's something we didn't have a slide for and I, I just wanted the board to be aware of, and that's with, uh, uh, let's see, did I have one more? You did. Go, go back. I'm go sorry. back one. My version didn't have that. I'm sorry. Go. Technology no. support. This is what we did get a slide for that. Okay. Um, we uh, are going to have to expand our help desks so that uh, students have a call in and teachers have a separate call in because, especially in the beginning, we're going to have um, a lot of questions to answer as people get used to their devices so that. That's going to be a support strategy. Uh, we are also going to have uh, device service and repair uh, service that's going to help us with this. So we've, uh, we've contracted with a vendor, so we will have an easy exchange of our one-to-one -one devices. Uh, we foresee that if a student has one that is not working right, they go into the media center, exchange it with the media center a staff, and they'll give them a replacement right away, and then that goes and the third party vendor then takes it and does the repair assessment and repair work. And so that's, uh, that's something that um, should uh, very greatly help us uh, make sure that that's a smooth and seamless transition for kids, get them right back to work. And then the last piece is what I wanted you to be aware of, the last bullet point, uh, Ms. Park, you can go back to a division to a device delivery process and timeline. Uh, we got some discouraging news yesterday. I want to make sure that you're aware of it. We were informed late yesterday that our second week of August uh, delivery, anticipated delivery date for all of our uh, Chromebook and Windows devices has slipped back to the end of August. And the reason for this is just, there's just unparalleled uh, global demand for these computers. I mean, almost every school system, even if they were already a one-to-one -one, is clamoring for extra units. This puts extreme pressure on our planned deployment, which would be uh, right there would be limited to one week. And we were hoping for a three week uh, process there. So it puts a lot of pressure on that. Actual delivery could slide either direction though, we're told, uh, but, we, but know that we're working with our vendor to identify ways that we can maybe expedite what is currently planned for the shipping. We're working with that deployment vendor to see if we can change the structure of the contract so that they could prepare more units in a quicker timeline. And we'll, of course, contingency plan to see if there's any other things that are within our, our purview right now that can help uh, cross the gap on that. So I so wanted you to be aware of that. And uh, you know, we're just in a lot of competition. Now. Okay, so I think now we're ready for my last slide. And this is an important one. So as we look at our COVID context, it's important to understand that uh, you see the line at the bottom. Both Centera and Riverside hospitals report a three-week three upward trend in hospital and ICU admissions. And when you look at the total cases, uh, the number on the left is York County, 
And then the right is our regional area, and that's inclusive of us. And that is us and all of our surrounding counties that are also take part in the regional program of New Horizons, right? <clears throat> so it's everybody who borders us and foster across the bridge. And when you look at those numbers, total since March 20, uh, we've had 237 cases, but, the, but our region has had almost 3,000. Hospitalizations for us, 13, but the region almost 200. And while we've, and I say only, uh, not in a light way, uh, three deaths in our county. There have been almost 40 in the region. So uh, when you pair those totals with the trend, and it doesn't look like that trend's gonna change anytime soon, it is concerning that the virus is very active in the community and could cause us problems if we put students in the building. And that uh, com completes my report. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Um, I actually don't have any questions. I think you've answered all mine earlier, the one I had, but a um, very good uh, comprehensive review. We'll both of them for everything you've done. But I'll, I'll ask him. Well, let me just ask uh, Mr. Higginbotham since he's online. Uh, um, yeah, I, I do have a, a real quick question. You talked about, you know, the, the need for like the clinic to have the like, quick quarantine room and the possibility of just more foot traffic of students in and out. And then the additional cleaning and disinfecting that the custodial staff is going to need. Are we going to need to look in, uh, into hiring additional staff to, to fit these uh, positions to help out? Uh, we don't anticipate that right now, but as with everything with this uh, situation, we're going to be flexible, assessing things early, and then making adjustments. Okay. Any other board members? Real quick, uh, I know we've got consultants, we've got public health officials engaged. Um, these uh, COVID-like viruses have a tendency, you know, in the fall, in cooler weather, weather to become more prevalent. Have there been, and these are just assumptions, but there, have there been any discussions about what we might anticipate in the fall? I don't know that we anticipated the uptick in the warm weather that we're seeing. We, I think, appreciate behavior is primarily responsible for that. Any discussions about what we might assume in the fall? Yeah, I was going to say, I asked that question and was asking if there was any local modeling, and there wasn't, unfortunately. Uh, but there was just concern that, as you state, uh, the combination of, of, of human behavior mm -hmm. and with the colder weather, what, what that will do for us. So we just know, you would know what you see in the news nationally and what that portends. And so we're we're looking for this to get worse in the near future. Uh, I know we we submitted our health plan to the state. Is that available for the public on our site? It the, is it currently is. on our website. Yes, yeah, so yeah, that families can go and review that just to see what strategy you put in place. Sure. I know you gave an overview, but it's an extensive yeah. document. So I encourage people yes. to look at that. Um, my other part is, and I don't know whether this is a, I guess this is a new question. Um, if, for example, we're in school, either hybrid level, traditional, and we've got to leave because of cases or whatever, does that mean that teachers can't go back and be in their classroom to do their lessons from the classroom over remote? No, in any, in, in any room, remote situation, teachers could be in their rooms and working. Okay. Certainly. Okay. Uh, we, would, we would probably, in that situation, uh, like you're saying, in a temporary closure, we would probably have them out for the two days then they could return for the rest of that time waiting for the contact tracing to be done. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions for Dr. Carroll? I'll let you out this time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Dr. Carroll, I appreciate that report. And again, um, he has done a, a lot of work leading our reopening team. And um, that last slide that he shared related to the number of COVID cases on the peninsula is important as we transition into Dr. Bladu because he's going to really focus on our workforce. So I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Bladu. Thank you, Dr. Shandor, uh, members of the board, and Mr. Richardson. So on our first slide here, I want to discuss a little bit about um, the logistics that still relates to where our staff live because that's an important data point. So you're looking at a map of southeastern Virginia. And uh, as far north as Doswell, you're looking as far east as Kilmarnock, 
going south, Virginia Beach, and then out to Franklin, and anywhere in between. There's a great geographic diversity where our staff live. So in looking at that information, uh, while some school divisions announced their some options, they many of them have not announced a final concrete plan. So um, each of those markers represent a locality that may have different decisions about COVID-19, infection rates, the spread, so on and so forth. And that information is important because the staff make decisions, uh, and I'll talk later about some of the options that they will have. Uh, each of those localities um, vary. On the next slide, you will see the distribution, uh, the numerical distribution of our employees. <laughs> so about 43% or 1,054 staff members live in your county. So if you think about the map I just shown, the remainder is spread among those localities. We do have a large cluster in Newport News, Williamsburg, um, Hampton, Gloucester, and Pocosin, but we have a lot of singletons in these localities, and that's important because each of the staff members represent a specialty, a content area, and a program. So as we're thinking about the 43% that live in the county and 57 that live out, decisions for returning to work are dependent on these local school divisions announcing a concrete plan. So um, when employees live and um, where they live and restart of school plans are critically important as folks are making decisions regarding childcare, accommodating vulnerable employees, and um, taking care of immunocompromised others. So on the next slide, I'd like to review some information from the Virginia, actually this is from the US Department of Labor. Earlier in the year, Congress passed the uh, Family First Coronavirus Response Act. So under this act, which is posted on the Department of Labor website, staff may qualify for leave when meeting one or more of the following criteria. So first, if individuals are subject to a federal, state, or local quarantine, they would qualify for paid leave. Second, if a healthcare provider advises them to self-quarantine, they also qualify. Third, if an individual experiences symptoms or seeking a medical diagnosis, they also qualify for leave. Fourth, if an individual or employee is taking care of another individual who's been advised to self-quarantine or they're immunocompromised, they also qualify for leave. And fifth, and this is an important one, um, caring for children whose child care or school has been closed or is unavailable due to COVID-19, individuals may qualify to as many as 12 weeks of paid leave that can be extended. So that's important information uh, for making any consideration. So we've learned that our employees, uh, many of them are experiencing childcare issues. Um, many of them may have reasonable ADA accommodations and many of them may be taking care of an immunocompromised other end under this act, they may qualify for these leave options. Next, I'd like to take you to some information, specific information relating to our staff. So this past Thursday, we sent out a form to all of our employees, 1,900 of them. And when I pulled this data out, we had 1,390 responses. And this data continues to change because um, you know, we still have until the end of today, and we're going to reach out to the remainder of employees that do not respond. But I can tell you one thing, as I monitor the proportions since last uh, Thursday, they stay the same, the proportion. So while the numbers may increase the proportion of staffing, the percentage have relatively been stable. So uh, also we recognize that staff may have other reservations about returning to work, but this is really to determine their availability for uh, work. So this time I'd like to take you through the data. So if you look at the largest part of the pie chart, 1,023 in the dark blue, or 73% of staff are available to return to work in person with no limitations. So next in green, we have 148, or about 11% that due to childcare issues, they cannot return to work, in-person work. Next in gray, we have 94, or 7% that intend to request leave, intend to uh, 
to request leave because they're the caretakers for immunocompromised persons in their immediate family uh, situation. And again, this is defined by the CDC, which provide guidelines, specific guidelines on what that means. And in purple, last slice there on the pie, you'll see that 125 or 9% intend to request ADA reasonable accommodation. The division already had a policy and a process for requesting those. And so it takes all of us to educate our students. As I stated, the availability of staff is critical information needed to select any model that was just presented. So based on these responses, it is foreseeable that approximately 27% of all division staff intend to apply and may qualify for leave under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. These factors show that many critical programs, including many singleton courses, particularly at the middle school and high school level, may not be able to be offered on site. So if I could take you to the next slide. So what exactly does that mean? When we look at the data, and the data also looked at courses, it looked at licensure, it looks at availability, because that's very important in the planning phase. Every school and every department is affected. Uh, about a one third of staff um, may not be available at some elementary, middle schools, and high schools. Also, when I requested the information regarding courses, there are approximately 114 secondary courses, which will have sections that will not be able to be offered in a face-to-face, in-person format. Take it to the next slide. So, um, the availability of SPED services, because all our special education teachers may also have limitations based on those three criteria I uh, described, um, may also be impacted. But as you're looking at this high school special, um, program specifically in the singletons, we have, for instance, in some of our schools that you may have only one person that teaches the content in a program such as IB, SOA, AP, BAN, CHORUS, and the list goes on. There are about 240 courses at the high school level and about 60 some at the middle school. So the availability of additional support services to include transportation, um, it may not be available. And uh, we're looking at specific programs such as inclusion and self-contained as some me staff members may not be able to report in a face-to-face -face format. So this information again is important uh, we continue to reach out to those employees who have not responded because it's going to be important to know specifically where, specifically the content, and specifically the request. So I know I presented quite a, a bit of information at this time. If you have any questions, I'll gladly answer them. So, Mr. Higginbotham, we're going to start with you since you're remote, just so I don't forget you. <laughs> uh, no, no questions for me. Okay, and I just have one question. Uh, on slide 72, you talked about the Department of Labor. Um, 12 weeks of leave uh, would have to be granted. After the 12 weeks, could they ask for an extension and continue that? Yes, that is what the flyer uh, that is posted then may continue. Okay, thank you. Does, but does this mean if we were in a remote setting that these staff members would be able to report to work or do we know if, if we're in a remote setting if those staff members and those content areas would still be available? It's a great question because the form requests under the current context in-person work. And I've talked to several staff members that came to see me personally and they said, well, I would only be requesting this accommodation if A, B, C were in place. However, if I may do my work remotely where I could receive an accommodation, then I may not be asking for this. So this was specifically for in-person work. I think too that though Canvas enables us even with kids, uh, forgive me, students and children in the building, they could still collect in a classroom and have that instruction presented remotely by a teacher who's impacted by any one of those conditions. So there would be a limit to that, though. Uh, I think Dr. Bondu said 114 classroom teachers. There's a, you still need to have an adult in the classroom with them if you're doing that. So that would tax our uh, substitutes or some other arrangement, but that that would be a concern we have to get verified. Yeah, still a capacity issue. Mm -hmm. 
Do we yeah. have the ability to survey our substitutes and find out how that pool is going to be affected? Our department reaches every year through our subs to confirm that they're available. So we reached out to them at the end of June, and we have 410 uh, substitutes that are available to work. Um, of those, about 390 can sub for both pairs and for teachers. So our sub pool has been very, very strong, and our folks have been committed to coming back. Um, but depending on the model, that may vary about what does it look like, for instance, to be a sub in campus, as Ms. Kenner had discussed during uh, synchronous instruction, when somebody has to be there, has to take attendance, because I think folks are still you know, need to take leave. It doesn't eliminate the, uh, the need to take leave uh, based on what some of those options are. Folks, uh, life happens and people need to take leave and our sub force is strong. If we're in a remote setting, how do we utilize every staff member? I know that um, one of the issues mm -hmm. during the spring was, you know, paraeducators, mm -hmm. how are we, you know, we're able to utilize them in a classroom setting doing what they normally sure. uh, normally do. How would we utilize all of our staff so that we can keep the remote control? That's a great question. So we have to look at the scale. Once this parent survey goes out and we know how many folks are gonna choose the academy, and then we know how many folks are maybe going through, you know, some of the phase of the models that were presented, then we can have a better idea about what that looks like. Uh, one thing to consider um, one day, we do are gonna need our bus drivers, we are gonna need our custodians. So we have to look at that because at any time, if the model changes and infection rates will reduce, then we need to be able to um, start almost immediately with one of those models. In the process, our department was going to work collaboratively to identify where in fact bus drivers or other employee groups may be, not all of them may be needed. And we're still going to have special programs that are going to require transportation. Then how can we repurpose those staff to alternative? Assignments. Alternative assignments. And I think we mentioned a little bit, we had a question about hiring, that we need to hire more of this. But now we have a workforce that can perhaps be repurposed to respond to some of the other yeah, for a temporary assignment. Any idea how this relates regionally to other numbers? I mean, we're looking at 75% from my own personal experience on the industry side. Yeah, we this is reasonably good. I'm, we don't have, you know, our response but, rate, we're still lacking, but... Yeah. Yeah, reasonably, I'm not sure I would define it as, as reasonably good when we see the 114 um, classes or, or courses. No, no, the impact is different, but you're right, just yeah. literally the, the, the numbers. Yeah, so I can share with you that I had a call this morning with the other six superintendents in our region, and they're all they're all experiencing the same, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the same concerns, the same um, issues with the workforce, the same issue and anxieties with uh, families and staff members. You know, we're all going through this thing together, um, not just in our region, but across you know, the tidewater and across the country, we're all dealing with this. So um, I, I'll say this again, we have to remain flexible with whatever model we choose when it comes to the model. However, we need to remain flexible within every situation as well. So anything that Dr. Carroll presented this evening, we're gonna have to be flexible with a number of those different options as well as instruction and working with our staff members. I mean, there, there are, we have received emails and there are more questions um, that we've received and more feedback that we've received over anything that I've ever been involved with in my 26 year career. What we'll commit to is we'll do everything we can, regardless of the situation we're in, to make sure that our staff members are safe and make sure that our kids are safe. So, but the key word there is flexibility. We've got to work with our community as partners and be as flexible as we can with all these situations. Do you foresee if we're in person that staff and um, students slash families would have to sign some type of waiver? Is there a discussion about that in the region? There's been some discussions about, you know, certifying whether staff, you know, for reporting procedures about reporting in. That is a legal question that requires the division attorney to look at about the viability of those issues. So we do not have that information right now, but we certainly look at it. We did, however, have our students sign waivers for summer conditioning, but we, we paused that right now, uh, waiting on a guidance on DHSL. Okay. Any additional questions for Dr. Ladu related to human resources? I think we're down to the superintendent's recommendation. All right, thank you, Mr. Richardson. All right, so based on the information that we have provided tonight, I'm prepared to provide a recommendation 
for the school board's consideration. But before I share my recommendation to the board, as I shared in my first slide, our plan is centered on these three collective commitments, safety of our staff and our students, our instruction for our students, and engaging our community and stakeholders related to, to feedback in this decision. I'm recommending we begin the first nine weeks in a remote model within the flexible framework. We can then move to either hybrid, leveled, or traditional models, or stay in a remote model based on the various data points. So when I talk about those data points, when you look at those metrics that you've heard heard tonight from Dr. Carroll and Dr. Bladu, we will continue reviewing state and federal guidance and phases. We'll look continue to look at the COVID-19 local conditions as well as a part uh, as far as our region. We will continue evaluating and reviewing on the staffing implications involved and we will commit to and evaluate metrics every other week as we move through this. For family and staff planning, we certainly want to identify natural opportunities when we can move in within the frameworks. We'll be looking at either quarterly or, or semester day, whether it's the first Monday of a particular month and or the return from a break or from traditional holidays that we are working through now. Additionally, this recommendation will provide schedule consistency. Students and staff would not move between models due to COVID-19 conditions or other factors for at least nine weeks. Students and staff do not have to adjust to two types of learning in school and remote at one time to start the school year. Finally, this recommendation, students become familiar with remote learning before being thrust into it due to a sudden school closure. So I wanna provide some additional information as we move forward. Remember, parents will be given the choice to follow the, the division's flexible framework, which is noted as option one. Or if parents do not want their student following this framework, they may select option two, which is the parent choice virtual academy option that you heard uh, Ms. Skinner speak of earlier this evening. So when you think about the parent choice process, Today, our staff shared a lot of information regarding the upcoming school year. On Monday evening, the school division will send out a survey to all families. As part of that survey, parents will decide if they plan to, number one, opt in for transportation services in the fall. Number two, if they plan to participate in the division provided one-to-one -one program. And third, if they would like their student enrolled in either option one, the flexible framework, or option two, virtual academy. Now we know that making a decision for your child or your children will be one of the most, one of the most difficult choices you'll make as a family. Trust me, I have three kids, one at every level, and I know how difficult this situation is. The division will provide a self-assessment tool to assist families throughout this process. Additionally, staff will continue to expand our return to school website and resources to support our students. We kindly ask that all parent responses be submitted by midnight, Sunday, August 2nd. Here are the next steps for the division and our stakeholders. We're holding two public forums Monday and Tuesday. I should say our school board is holding two public forums Monday and Tuesday for next week. We're accepting public comment via uploading videos. And if someone cannot upload a video, we will accept voicemails. On June 30th, the board will hold a special meeting to formally vote on this recommendation. While we, while we are opening the parent choice process, Monday, July 27th, we encourage parents to take your time to make in making this important decision. All parents will need to complete a parent choice commitment form for each child enrolled in the division by again, midnight, um, Sunday, August 2nd. Information about how community members can share comments by videos prior to the comment sessions, along with information about the parent commitment forms is available on the division website and Facebook page and are being sent to fam all families and staff by email 
this evening. Once again, I want to thank our team for their hard work in the development of this plan. I want to thank the many parents, teachers, and staff who provided us feedback either in focus groups or in the surveys. And finally, I want to thank the board for the many questions and support they've provided throughout this past year and throughout this summer. This concludes our presentation for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shandor. And uh, I want to thank you and your team for everything they've done. And I don't think the, the people in the community really realize the amount of hours that have been spent, especially this school year, not just with the fire at Grafton, but with this COVID response. And just as an example, last night, um, I was talking to you on the phone at 930 at night, <laughs> and you were just leaving the office here, in, here at the school board office. And there were still members of his team that were still here working. Um, so that's the commitment that we have of our employees that are working around the clock pretty much to, to make sure this, this happens. So I want to thank your team for that. Um, and I know even when you were on vacation, I think we talked, I want to say every day, but probably a couple of days where you were on vacation with your family, uh, just to make sure we had everything coordinated for these special meetings that were coming up uh, to try to set dates, the times and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it's, it's been a lot. And um, we appreciate your sacrifice and being away from your families uh, to do all this. So thank you. Um, so board members, we have a big decision to make next Thursday. Um, but on Monday and Tuesday, Dr. Shandor and I will review the comments so we can tape them and have them all together in one platform so we can put them out to the public so they can see them as well. And board members will be able to, to see those comments once we tape them. I think we're gonna do it live so you can actually watch live while we're in here and watching them too. You can do it either on Monday at six o'clock and, 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 and Tuesday at noon. Correct, right. yes, it's right here on this part. So this um, part, we'll go back to- So the they'll be pre-recorded. There'll be pre-recorded comments from the public, so that's how we're going to do those to make sure everybody has an opportunity to, to speak. Um, and just keep in mind, you just have to state your name, and your address, and then you make your comment. And you have three minutes to comment. So, just as a reminder, we have another special meeting next Thursday, July 30th at 5 p.m. to make a final decision relating to our reopening plan. And we're going to be adjourned. And thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you.